My name is Stefan Sinclair. I'm from the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at McGill University. I realize that this is a busy time of year, with uh, at least for the academic, uh, the academics in in the room, uh, in terms of uh, grades that need to be submitted and taxes that need to be submitted, and I don't know what else that need to be submitted. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I have a, a series of, of other thank yous that I'd, I'd like to uh, express. Uh, I'd like to thank the Faculty of Arts uh, at McGill, uh, the Institute for Public Life of Arts and Ideas, I play uh, at McGill, the, the Office of Public Affairs at McGill, which uh, is very kindly um, uh, recording this for all eternity. Um, La Faculté des Arts, des Arts et Sciences de l'Université de Montréal uh, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, SHRC, um, that has uh, made uh, this roundtable possible. I'd also like to thank uh, my co-organizer, Michael Eberly Sinatra, uh, from the Université de Montréal, and uh, Matthew Milner, if he's in the room, uh, who uh, did a lot of the legwork for organizing uh, the, the, this event. Um, I'd like, now like to invite uh, Dean Chris Manfredi uh, to say a few words uh, of welcome. Merci Stéphane, je suis uh, très heureux d'être ici ce, cet après-midi pour vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette uh, conférence. Um, about a year and a half ago, we decided in the Faculty of Arts that McGill University should become the leading Canadian University in Digital Humanities, and we began by starting to recruit people to lead this list project. And I'm very pleased that Stefan uh, accepted our invitation to become a member of the faculty at McGill. It occurred at an opportune moment as we were undergoing what sometimes can be a difficult process of merging four language and literature departments into a single department, languages, literatures, and cultures, and I think the Digital Humanities Project provided a focus for that merger, and I think has uh, made that merger more than simply a bureaucratic convenience, which it was never intended to be, but has established uh, a leading uh, uh, center of gravity for work in languages, literatures, and cultures, including uh, the digital humanities. I want to congratulate Stefan and uh, his collaborators uh, from the University of Montréal and elsewhere uh, for putting on this conference today. I know it will be interesting, and I wish you all the best. And I will stop now because nothing lowers the intellectual content of an event more quickly than a speech from a dean. So it's better that I stop now. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the focus of the, the round table is really on uh, our, our six panelists, and I want to uh, very quickly get out of the way um, so that we can hear what they have to say and then um, move into a discussion, an open discussion. Uh, I do want to um, say a couple of words about the genesis of the round table. Um, I was contacted uh, a couple of months ago by a journalist uh, in Quebec who was looking for uh, compelling examples of digital humanities. In fact, um, you, uh, you know, the translation in French isn't always obvious, but at that time uh, he, he used the word humanité numérique. Um, and uh, so he was interested in, he, you know, I, who knows how he'd heard of, of digital humanities, but he, he knew that this was something that was emerging that... Uh, that was um, worth considering, uh, and he wanted um, some pointers to interesting projects. Um, so instead of doing what I should have done, which was to point him to a certain number of the usual suspect projects that, um, that are, are, are fine examples of digital humanities, uh, I, I sort of launched into a bit of existential angst uh, about, the, about digital humanities and about the nature of knowledge and about the nature of discovery in the humanities and about the nature of building in the digital humanities and, and trying to make the case that um, the, the, the idea of a discovery that can uh, be well captured in a headline uh, of a newspaper um, is, is maybe something that is worth looking more closely at. Um, so that, that exchange um, got me thinking more broadly about the opportunities and challenges uh, for the digital humanities to reach a broader public and to confirm the relevance of the humanities in today's society. Uh, it's not a new concern, neither in the humanities nor the digital humanities. 
but there was a, a, a workshop that was being organized, that's being organized, that's going on at the moment in Montreal that has brought together several uh, high profile um, digital humanists. Uh, and it seemed like a perfect opportunity to get uh, a broader discussion going about what the public digital humanities might look like. Uh, so just to give you a sense of, of the format, I, I, asked, uh, the I, I asked the panelists to, uh, to uh, do their best to keep their uh, remarks very short. I, I asked them to have five minutes uh, where they were presenting, um, showcasing uh, a compelling example of digital humanities and to offer some reflections about that uh, so that it would leave us time for, for a discussion afterwards. Uh, so we're going to go through um, each, of, each of the panelists and we may as well follow the, the, uh, the order that, um, that people are, are sitting here. Um, after that, we are going to, I'm going to ask um, Ray Siemens uh, introduce and ask Reese, Reese Siemens to do uh, a bit of a synthesis and uh, a response to the panel and to help us transition into a broader discussion. After that, there'll, there'll be a reception and I hope you all stay for that. So our first panelist is uh, Sophie Marcotte. I, I should say, by the way, that the panel will be uh, bilingual uh, to some extent. Um, uh, and uh, our first uh, panelist, Sophie Marcotte, um, and uh, I will read this in French in the nature, in the, in the, in the spirit of things. Sophie Marcotte est la directrice de l'antenne NT2 uh, Concordia et membre de Figura. Elle co-dirige le groupe de recherche sur Gabriel Roy depuis 2002 et travaille un projet de recherche individuelle qui vise la création d'une communauté virtuelle autour de l'œuvre de Gabriel Roy. Hyper, euh, hyper Elle a publié une édition des lettres de Gabriel Roy à son mari, Marcel Carbot, mon cher grand fou, lettre à Marcel Carbot, 1947 à 79, chez Boréal, cahier Gabriel Roy, 2001. Et a préparé euh, avec François Tricard et Jane Everett l'édition du Pays de Bonheur d'occasion et autres, et, et autres écrits autobiographiques et par et inédits. Elle a publié des articles et des comptes rendus dans des revues et des collectifs canadiens, états-uniens et européens. Merci Stéphane. Uh, I should really update that bio on <laughs> the site. Um, donc, euh, je vais euh, commencer par quelques, quelques remarques euh, avant de vous présenter euh, de façon, euh, j'allais dire, un peu plus détaillée, mais le temps ne me le permettra peut-être pas, euh, de vous présenter ce projet qui est le projet Hyper Roi. Alors, euh, comme vous le savez sans doute déjà, Gabrielle Roy, elle est considérée comme l'une des romancières euh, les plus importantes de la littérature québécoise et canadienne moderne. Elle a laissé une œuvre très abondante et aussi très diversifiée. Euh, C'est ce que les gens ne connaissent pas toujours. Euh, on sait qu'elle a publié « Bonheur d'occasion » en 1945. On sait aussi qu'elle a publié « La détresse et l'enchantement » en 1984. Ce sont deux titres qui ont également connu énormément de succès euh, dans leur traduction en anglais, euh, sous les titres de « Tin Flute » euh, et « The Enchantment and Sorrow ». Euh, mais par contre, euh, on sait peu de choses de l'entre-deux, c'est-à-dire de l'œuvre qu'elle a publiée entre 1945 et 1984, et surtout euh, du nombre considérable d'inédits, de manuscrits, euh, de dactylogrammes et d'autres types d'avant-textes qui nous permettent justement d'étudier euh, peut-être ce que j'appellerais le travail ou le processus d'invention et d'écriture euh, de Gabriel Leroy. Alors, c'est la perspective d'éditer ces textes sur support numérique qui a euh, conduit à la constitution euh, de l'Hyperroi, un site interactif qui rassemble les chercheurs et les lecteurs intéressés à l'œuvre de Roy, où nous publions désormais ses manuscrits et ses inédits. Ce que nous voulions faire, c'est de mettre sur pied un espace dynamique qui est capable d'illustrer les changements qui caractérisent la perception de l'œuvre de Gabriel Roy au fur et à mesure que le discours critique sur cette œuvre progresse et au fur et à mesure également qu'apparaissent de nouvelles approches des textes. 
Alors, euh, en 2009, nous avons entrepris, euh, avec des collègues d'ici, de McGill, François Ricard et Jen Everett, une première phase du projet qui a été subventionnée par le CRSH. Et je suis très heureuse de vous annoncer que nous venons d'obtenir euh, une subvention savoir du CRSH pour les quatre prochaines années. Donc, nous pourrons poursuivre euh, euh, avec, euh, avec ce projet. Alors, euh, l'Hyperwa, en fait, c'est une communauté virtuelle qui est en développement continu et qui vise à favoriser l'échange des connaissances sur l'œuvre de Gabriel Leroy. Alors, qui bénéficie euh, d'un tel projet? Bien sûr, les chercheurs universitaires qui le consultent pour alimenter leurs propres travaux euh, et qui viennent aussi l'enrichir en publiant les résultats de leurs recherches sur le site sous forme d'articles savants. Les étudiants de niveau universitaire et collégial qui le consultent surtout pour ce qu'on appelle, nous, la bibliographie critique. Donc, qui est en fait euh, une recension de tous les livres, de toutes les thèses, de tous les articles qui ont paru sur Gabriel Leroy au cours des 40 dernières années. Donc, on a jusqu'à peu près jusqu'à 600 euh, références qui euh, sont accompagnées d'un commentaire critique, donc qui permettent déjà à l'utilisateur, au lecteur, d'avoir une idée euh, euh, du contenu des articles en question. Qui le consultent également, ben, les professeurs dans les cours de littérature québécoise, mais aussi les professeurs dans les cours de création littéraire, de rédaction et même de traduction et euh, de français langue seconde. Et enfin, ce qu'il y a peut-être de plus important par rapport au thème de la table ronde aujourd'hui, le public lecteur. Parce que Gabriel Leroy, si Gabriel Leroy euh, rejoint encore aujourd'hui plusieurs chercheurs dans les, cercles, dans les cercles universitaires, elle rejoint encore euh, un public lecteur qui est toujours curieux d'en apprendre un peu plus sur les coulisses euh, de son œuvre et également, euh, il faut dire, de sa vie. De manière plus générale, euh, le projet découle d'une reconfiguration de la manière dont nous envisageons la recherche en littérature et dans les autres domaines du savoir. Cette reconfiguration, dans le cas qui nous occupe ici, passe par la philosophie open source, qui est empruntée euh, dans notre cas aux sciences pures et appliquées, mais qui est adaptée à, à nos besoins de la recherche euh, en sciences humaines et sociales. Alors, ce que ça signifie pour nous dans le projet Hyperroi, c'est que de travailler en open source, ça sous-entend qu'on est en mesure de consulter librement en fait, que tout lecteur est en mesure de consulter librement une version numérique des textes qui les intéressent. Ici, on va avoir, entre autres, des manuscrits de Gabriel Leroy. Est-ce que c'est assez long à charger? Alors, le lecteur a accès à tous les manuscrits. Ici, l'image est plus ou moins claire. C'est la première page, c'est la première page d'un cahier. Je vais vous donner la suivante et je peux la mettre en plein écran. Alors, on a accès euh, au manuscrit, on a accès euh, également à un texte édité. Travailler en open source, ça signifie aussi la possibilité d'obtenir un accès libre et gratuit aux résultats de la, de la recherche qui sont menées sur ces mêmes objets d'études. Donc, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, des publications savantes. Nous avons un espace de publication savante qui est, euh, euh, si on veut... Euh, euh, sanctionné par un comité de lecture, euh, donc qui permet euh, aux chercheurs de soumettre des articles sur Gabriel Leroy. Et enfin, euh, travailler en open source, pour nous, ça signifie le partage du code informatique qui forme l'architecture du site Hyperroi, qui devient public dans la mesure où il peut être réutilisé pour la mise sur pied d'une autre plateforme semblable, qui pourrait être réutilisée. Car euh, je pense qu'il est important de préciser qu'au-delà de l'édition et de l'analyse des manuscrits et des inédits qui sont conservés dans les archives de Gabriel Leroy à Bibliothèque et Archives Canada, il apparaît très intéressant par ce partage d'inciter aussi d'autres chercheurs à créer une structure semblable qui mettrait en valeur les fonds d'archives d'autres auteurs. C'est d'ailleurs cette réflexion sur la notion de partage des connaissances et de circulation du savoir, c'est de cette réflexion qu'est né l'hyperroi. Ainsi, des communautés virtuelles qui adopteraient d'autres objets d'études pourront emprunter cette même structure, le partage des connaissances n'étant plus ici seulement lié au contenu, mais également à l'architecture de l'espace numérique. Le modèle de la communauté virtuelle sur lequel est fondé ce projet Hyperroi sollicite aussi la participation active des chercheurs, comme je le disais, et vient établir un nouveau modèle de circulation du savoir. Et, ce qui est important pour nous également, au-delà de la simple dimension d'archivage et euh, d'édition électronique, 
c'est le fait que cette entreprise est susceptible d'entraîner des répercussions importantes sur la diffusion du patrimoine culturel et littéraire et également sur l'émergence de nouvelles approches de la culture et de la littérature, euh, de nouvelles approches qui, ne seraient, qui seraient peut-être un peu moins restrictives et euh, qui, euh, qui permettraient d'ouvrir euh, les frontières de la recherche littéraire vers une perspective interdisciplinaire. Ce projet est lié à un autre projet qui s'appelle l'Observatoire de l'imaginaire contemporain. L'Observatoire de l'imaginaire contemporain, c'est euh, en fait, ce qu'on appelle un environnement de recherche et de connaissance qui est conçu par le Centre Figura. Le Centre Figura, c'est le centre de recherche sur euh, le texte et l'imaginaire. Alors, l'Observatoire de l'imaginaire contemporain, c'est bien sûr un lieu de recherche en soi, vous pourrez, je vous invite à aller euh, peut-être le, le consulter de, façon, de manière un peu plus détaillée. C'est un site sur lequel on va retrouver euh, des articles, des actes de colloque, euh, où on va retrouver également des blogs, par exemple des blogs de chercheurs. Mais c'est également un, un, un site, un lieu de recherche qui permet le renouvellement des, des stratégies de diffusion des résultats de la recherche et qui permet la circulation de documents qui sont liés à la recherche, des documents qui ne sont pas publiés dans les circuits traditionnels. Donc, on reproduit sur le site de l'OIC, par exemple, des communications, des tables rondes, comme celles euh, qui, euh, qui se déroulent aujourd'hui, des cahiers de recherche, des ateliers de formation, des captations euh, audio et vidéo de cours ou euh, de conférences. Alors, le contenu du site Hyperroi euh, est appelé, dans les prochaines années, dans la nouvelle phase du projet qu'on entre, qu entreprend, à être indexé euh, au euh, contenu du site de l'Observatoire de l'imaginaire contemporain afin de faire partie de ce, ce vaste environnement de recherche euh, et de connaissances. Alors, ce que je dirais rapidement pour conclure, parce que je veux vraiment respecter euh, le temps qui m'a été euh, imparti, c'est que ce projet Hyperroi permet d'établir des ponts entre l'université, les institutions publiques euh, où sont conservées les archives, et le grand public. Et ils permettent aux lecteurs d'avoir accès à un pan très important du patrimoine littéraire et culturel canadien et québécois, euh, à des objets qui lui appartiennent euh, finalement. D'où l'importance, selon moi, de travailler à d'autres projets de la sorte qui permettent la démocratisation et l'accessibilité au savoir qu'on réserve peut-être trop souvent au cercle universitaire. Uh, merci, Sophie. Um, our, our second speaker will be uh, Ichiro Fujinaga, uh, who's associate professor and chair of the music technology area of the Schulich School of Music at McGill. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in music percussion and mathematics from University of Alberta, master's degree in music theory, and PhD in music technology from McGill. Uh, in 2003-04, he, he, his, his bio page isn't up to date. I, I think I'll talk to him about that uh, after this. But he was acting director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music and Media and Technology, Kermit. Uh, research interests include music theory, machine learning, music perception, digital signal processing, genetic, genetic algorithms, and music information acquisition, preservation, and retrieval. Okay, so last Monday, do you want me to do something? Has to be mirror, but I can't see my notes then. Okay, it's all right. I have, I have backup. I'll, re I'll have to. Okay. Technology.
the other windows and do this and you know just play and all right are we good okay so uh last monday i came back are we okay it's no Okay, let me let me just start here. Are we good? No? Okay, okay, all right. Okay, so as I was saying, I just came back from uh, Beirut, Lebanon last uh, Monday, and where Andrew Hankinson, a PhD student, and myself spent three days consulting for uh, a, a group to preserve uh, music uh, heritage of the Arabic world. And uh, these, these music from most from the latter 20th century, and we were invited by a small nonprofit group called IRAB, headed by a young man named Basil Kassem. Uh, how, we, how I met Basel is kind of interesting. A little over five years ago, in March 2007, uh, out of the blue, I get an email uh, saying that uh, he's from uh, Lebanon, and I've never heard of this guy before, and there's no introduction or nothing. And he says he claims that he has 10,000 hours of music he wants to digitize, and that the, the political situation in Lebanon is so bad that he wants to come to Montreal and digitize it and he wants a letter of invitation from me so they can come to Canada. Remember, this is 2007. The summer before, you know, Hezbollah and Israel were just shooting missiles at each other and like, you know, thousand people, thousand Lebanese died and he's asking me to write a letter. So it wasn't, I can't say it was immediately that I responded to write him a letter of recommendation, although it was a great uh, project. And uh, it turns out that he has a girlfriend at University of Montreal studying PhD doing demography. Anyway, long story short, uh, he comes to, uh, to uh, Montreal in the summer with a bag full of cassette tapes and he starts digitizing our lab and he leaves in the fall and comes back next, next summer again with another bag of uh, cassette tapes and ever since we've been in contact. And uh, you know, it was first time for us to be in the Middle East and we're, we're quite excited. And we were staying in uh, West Beirut in a commercial area called Hamra. And uh, it was also the home of the, their digitization studio and the headquarters of IRAB. So we arrived at this, uh, their headquarters uh, and uh, of this nonprofit NGO headed by Basel. And it's on this ground floor right off the main street of Hamra. And it's really small. As you can see, that's Andrew over there. And uh, it's the size of a small shop. It's actually was a little jewelry shop before that, and there was a big, big safe inside. Um, so, and uh, we go in there, and uh, and this this is our man, Basil. Um, he he was he was mostly worked in a radio station in Lebanon, and he's been collecting music over the last ten years or more. And this wall, as you can see, is covered with tapes and records and drawers and, and the shelves are all full of music. And Basil tells me there's a lot more at his home. And, uh, and he also he's been buying up uh, all these tape machines from eBay. So, you know, they don't make these anymore. And uh, recently he received the CEU funding so that he can, he can buy some new equipment and also have us come in, talk to them about it. Um, and so we spent, three days uh, in Beirut explaining about the importance of metadata, uh, the best practice for digital audio digitization, how to set up a digital repository. Uh, we also introduced them, introduced them to Omika, uh, which is a content management system that's, that was uh, produced at George Mason University at their Center for uh, History and New Media. It's a DH center. And uh, they seem to like the software and uh, we chose Omeka over others like, you know, Fedora, uh, Drupal, or DSpace because we had no idea what kind of technical support Basel can get. 
Uh, note that these guys are Basso's friends, and they're just following their, their time uh, for this cause. So the first concern was the, the language issue, the localization, and getting Omika to play in Arabic, you know, just play in Arabic, and that was crucial. And Omika has started to uh, translate their interfaces, and they, they offer th over 30 languages, but Arabic wasn't one of them. So they, uh, we just downloaded 650 terms and uh, phrases. Uh, they have a translation table, and uh, the part of the team started uh, translating right away. And we then showed them how to edit um, the, the metadata entry form and their, how to redesign and modify the sort of default theme for the public uh, facing website. And I, I, I think they really uh, uh, enjoyed our assistance. And on the way back, uh, on the flight, I decided to start a new project uh, called MOB. Uh, it stands for Music Archivist Without Borders and preserving musical heritage from anywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next we have uh, Susan Brown, um, who's director of the Orlando Project and project leader of the Canadian Writing, uh, Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory, um, uh, Quirk. Uh, and everyone is fine with that acronym except Susan, I think she, she doesn't like that. Uh, she's a visiting professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta and professor in English and Theater Studies at the University of Guelph. She's a Victorianist whose research centers on the application of digital technology to the pursuit of literary history and spans aspects of text encoding, text mining, interface design, and usability. Recent work has begun to investigate the exploration and visualization of social ne networks as embedded in semantic encoding. She is fascinated by the critical theories of technology, particularly feminist perspectives, and the impacts of earlier media, media and technological innovation on modes of literary production. And I'm realizing that I don't know if I have oh, your slides here. You don't recognize any of those titles, do you? Do you have Rodan? Yeah. Should be better if we can copy it over quicker. Okay. Just put it in a sec. Hello there. Um, the assignment we were given was to talk about an exemplary public DH project, and I've kind of refused the terms of it. I, I want instead to sort of think across a range of projects that I think are great examples of aspects of things that would be great in uh, a public digital humanities that has yet to come into being. So I want to start by going back a uh, ways in history and also in the history of the digital humanities. This is Letitia Elizabeth Landon, who's one of the famous, most famous poets of the early 19th century and who had a very scandalous life. She was a single female writer living in London at a time when uh, professional writers who were women were extremely rare. Uh, she was kind of ogled over by um, undergraduates at the universities when, the, when her poetry came out. Everyone was speculating about her life and possible impropriety in her relationships. And this speculation continued right through to the mid-1990s when uh, somebody who lived in um, Australia or New Zealand, I think it was, who turned out to be a descendant of Letitia Elizabeth Landon, discovered that uh, the great-grandmother was all over the web and that literary scholars were talking about her and divulged the fact that she had, in fact, had illegitimate children. Nobody had really been able to pin this down, although there was lots of um, 
as I say, speculation and rumor that went on in her lifetime. So I, I start with Landon because um, this came, this fact, this important fact about her life came to light not because of a fancy website, but just because people were doing scholarship in public using uh, technologies that are completely natural and normal to us now, listservs and email, not uh, any, and, and I think there was a rudimentary sort of hypertext website of, of her work that had gone up, but there wasn't anything that was technologically flashy. What there was was an openness in the scholarly process that brought public engagement to bear on, on uh, what scholars were doing and ended up, I think, uh, benefiting. Uh, both both Landon's uh, descendants and also the scholarly community that now knows a lot more about her than they had before. Um, so that low technological threshold, I think, is important to what a, a public digital humanities would be. Mutual benefit is important. Access is key to both. Um, in my field, literary studies, it's really the texts themselves um, the, the information, if you like, about, uh, about writing uh, that really matters to people, content. These are the things that I think um, really will bring uh, public uh, engagement to uh, what the digital humanities are doing. And I think participation and crowdsourcing are becoming really important to that process, being, bringing people together with the content in a way that they can actually engage with it. So this is a project out of... Um, London that uh, has people transcribing the works of Jeremy Bentham, who was an extremely prolific writer of the early 19th century, and um, they are tracking, you know, how it's going. Box two has got, you know, 62% done. Box 27, they tell you what people have been working on most and, and so on. So they've really done a great job of bringing a lot of people into the process of actually digitizing texts, digitizing handwritten texts that cannot be scanned and, and OCR'd like, like printed texts, but that are very, very important to our knowledge about who we are and where we came from. Um, there's also the Old Weather Project, which comes out of a collaboration between humanists and scientists, where people are transcribing ship's logs, which kept very detailed records of the weather in order to um, be able to know more about what the climate has been so that we can evaluate where we are with climate change, right? So it's important to historians, it's important to, to uh, climatologists. Um, so th these, I think, are two, more, two examples of the way that um, public participation can really make a difference. But content really is key. Uh, representative poetry online is actually a digital version of uh, introductory poetry textbook that was digitized. It, it's been used at the University of Toronto for literally generations of students. And Ian Lancashire, one of the visionaries of digital humanities in this country, put it online, has been updating it, making it more representative, that is putting women and minority poets in there who weren't there before. And he gets hundreds of emails a year from people who have discovered it and who have used it. He's updated it. This is sort of the latest interface, so you can see that he's um, you know, got mapping there. It used to just be plain text. So it, it is using emergent technologies, newer technologies, to um, leverage the content in new ways. But the fact that there's really good, substantial content there, that it's got good, solid scholarly apparatus, is absolutely key, I think, to its value. That's gold, I think, when we're thinking about a public digital humanities. Is there needs to be something substantial for people to engage with. However, thinking of precious metals and gems, I think if we are uh, speculating on what uh, the greatest public impact a digital humanities or uh, humanities-oriented digital um, project might have had, uh, we might think of Bejeweled or of Plants versus Zombies, who were produced by PopCat Games, and the chief... Uh, creative officer of PopCat Games is a, a guy named Jason Kapalka, who is, has a BA in English from the University of Alberta and an MA, a creative MA in English from the University of Alberta. We should not be shy of proclaiming the debt of the creative and entertainment industries to the humanities. However, to go back to more obviously academic ones, um, the other thing that we're pushing forward, I think, is the mandate of the humanities to engage in humanly meaningful, relevant, uh, socially relevant and responsible advancement of knowledge. And I think uh, a public digital humanities 
in that sense needs to be pushing against the tendency of the web to assert the lowest common denominator in discourse and in content. And so the two projects that I've brought up here are, one is the Women Writers Project at Brown University, which is digitizing um, many uh, previously inaccessible texts by women, manuscripts by women, uh, and uh, the Orlando Project, which I'm involved in, which is about recovering uh, literary history associated with women writers in Britain and beyond. Um, so recovery projects, re projects that are um, bringing to light and, and bringing to public attention uh, aspects of culture, of human knowledge, of society that were not that are that are not part of the mainstream um, record are are hugely important. But one thing about both of these projects that is problematic from a, thinking about a public digital humanities is that they're both behind subscription walls. They're licensed, and so they're not getting out to most people. And for that reason, I will move on. Um, Great Unsolved Mysteries of Canadian History is a fantastic project coming out of the history community in Canada, which is taking marginalized stories and um, bringing them to public attention. It is open access. It's um, great in terms of bringing people into contact with primary sources, so it actually gives you the evidence that scholars need to decide important questions like, did Angelique burn down Montreal, or, or was she framed? Um, and it also, it, it it's not about answers so much as it's about questions about the process of critical thinking and trying to understand exactly how one makes sense of all this source material. But I still think we have a, a very long way to go. I'm with um, Alan Liu, who has, along with other people, founded a movement called For Humanities, which is trying to um, use the, the power of the digital humanities to uh, impress upon institutions and the public at large the importance of humanistic ways of knowing, humanistic research, humanistic thinking, critical thinking. Uh, he has a very important article called Where is the Cultural Criticism in Digital Humanities, which puts the onus on us as a community to be doing more in the kinds of projects that we instigate and that we su support to ask the really hard questions, to engage in, uh, very, in, in productive, critical dialogue with, um, with uh, social questions and um, make ourselves more publicly relevant. So there are not very many projects that I think are um, embodying all of the aspects that I would want to see in a public digital humanities. Um, this is a Montreal-based project coming out of Concordia University, out of, out of Stephen High's um, Central for Oral Story Storytelling. Um, it has a lot of those components, but even so, it's, um, it's, so it's engaged with current social issues, with, uh, with trauma survivors living in Montreal, with living stories, with, with being answerable to those communities and partnering with them. It's producing um, open software, but it's still not all that easy to actually take that software and use it um, for those who aren't sort of directly involved with the project. It's still not something you can just sort of take and run with, but I think it's a very important model. So I don't know exactly where we're going with public digital humanities. I think we're at er very early stages yet, uh, which is not surprising, and this is all, um, we're, we're talking about a field that's very new in, in many respects. Um, but better cultural content to draw people in, crowdsourcing or engagement with people and giving people a chance to participate in what we're doing, um, fostering citizen scholarship. Uh, the, as, as many people have observed in many ways, the web has troubled uh, traditional um, practices of, of authorization and uh, we should embrace that and figure out where we go from there in terms of the production of knowledge rather than, than sticking with the old um, the old paradigms. Um, at its best though, what I think a public digital humanities would do is, uh, as I say, have benefit on both sides. It would, I think, uh, help to strengthen the case for the humanities, which we need to make to those who fund our activities, but it would also, I think, provide a huge value to a public that has, um, that uses the capacity of digital technologies in, in very shallow and limited ways in many respects. So um, I look forward to seeing where we all go. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Our next panelist is uh, John Unsworth. 
In February of 2012, John Unsworth began an appointment as the Vice Provost for Library and Technology Services and Chief Information, you have to draw a big breath for, Chief Information Officer at Brandeis University. He moves to this post uh, from the University of Illinois at Am Urbana-Champaign where he was Dean of the Graduate uh, School of Library and Information Science um, at, at, at Illinois. Um, in addition to being professor at Gislis, uh, Illinois, uh, he also had appointments in the Department of English and on the li library faculty. Um, for, uh, uh, sorry. Um, from two, no, it's not. <laughs> during the 10 years before coming to Illinois, I, I was skipping some bits, but during the 10 years before coming to Illinois, from 1993 to 2003, he served as the first director of the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities, IATH, and a faculty member in the, department, uh, in the English department at the University of, of Virginia. His first faculty appointment was in English at North Carolina State University from 1989 to 1993. We're not done. In 1990, at NCSU, he co-founded the first peer-reviewed electronic journal in the humanities, Postmodern Culture, now published by Johns Hopkins University Press and part of the P Project Muse. He also organized, incorporated, and chaired the Text and Coding Initiative Consortium, co-chaired the Modern Languages Association Committee on Scholarly Edition, and served as president of the Association for Computers and the Humanities, and later as chair of the steering committee for the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. Now we're done. So I have to read some notes, so I'll be operating dueling computers here. Um, what do you see in that picture? <laughs> the mess. Oh, I got it. Sorry. Is that okay for you? Because it's not mirrored anymore here. At this point, we've, we've given up on that. Okay, good. Well, then I can just use one computer. Um, so a mess, what else? <laughs> a man, a man in a mess. <laughs> hmm? Hoarding. Yeah, no, that's it. Uh, this, this is the den of a hoarder. Um, that's Michael Hart. Um, Michael Hart uh, was the founder of uh, Project Gutenberg, and Michael Hart died last September. Um, and when I was asked to think about the future of uh, public humanities and public digital humanities, as a humanist, my natural impulse was to begin by thinking about the past. And if you wanted to find a starting point for public digital humanities, I think Arguably, Michael Hart's Project Gutenberg would be a starting point. And though we may, in some senses, be in the early stages of this endeavor, Michael started uh, Project Gutenberg in 1971, so uh, a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> July 4th, 1971, actually. Uh, Michael Hart was a student at the University of Illinois at that point. Uh, he had just gotten that day uh, $100,000 of funny money uh, uh, connected to his mainframe account and was trying to think of something uh, worthy of $100,000 to do. Uh, and he'd been to a 4th of July celebration and as he was coming home, he picked up one of these parchment copies of the Declaration of Independence and it fell out of his shopping bag and he thought, <coughs> great, I'll, I'll type that in and distribute it. Um, so he says his initial plan uh, was to email it uh, to everybody, all 100 people on the internet. Um, uh, but he was told that that would crash the entire system <laughs> if he did that. So instead he put a message on what later became comp.gen, which uh, was later a Usenet news group, and he kept the files on the school's tape farm. He said people would send an email if they wanted to see it and someone in the computer lab would load the tape, usually my best friend, and then we would tell them where it was and how to download it. 
Uh, so that was how text was originally distributed in this effort. Um, so this began uh, not only early in the history of public digital humanities, it began early in the history of the internet. And, and there's, a, there's an important little detail in that story, which was somebody told him he couldn't do something. And that's a key element in, the, in this story. Uh, I will come back to it. Uh, he started typing in other books, and uh, one at a time by himself. And by 1987, he'd uh, typed in 300 uh, literary texts. Uh, he had a breakthrough in the 80s. He got connected to the PC users group at the University of Illinois, and they had a mailing list. And through that mailing list, he began to recruit people to host mirror sites and uh, other volunteers to transcribe texts. And as you can see on the slide here, the site at the moment distributes 38,000 free ebooks in multiple formats. 38,000 ebooks at this point is a very small number, um, but these are ebooks that are uh, still in some significant way produced by hand. Um, so uh, a lot of them do begin as OCR texts that then uh, get corrected. Uh, I actually had occasion to provide Michael with some computing resources in 1994 from the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities to run OCR software that was written for him by a guy named Michael Larson, who was then, I think, a postdoc at Penn in the math department, is now in the math department at Indiana University. I received some of Michael's famously right justified emails. He would type in a monospace Whoa. font emails that were always right justified. <laughs> that is a sign of mental illness. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I actually had, I had dinner with him once, and he is kind of crazy, or he was, um, but totally fanatically dedicated uh, to this endeavor, which is another important quality um, in this kind of person. Uh, Michael was an inspiration to others. He was an inspiration specifically to Brewster Kahle, uh, who uh, is the founder of the Internet Archive, which has Project Gutenberg texts in it now. And uh, Brewster wrote a, uh, a, a lovely blog entry as a sort of obituary um, when Michael died. He was also an inspiration to Greg Newby, who started working with Gutenberg when he was a mainframe consultant and adjunct faculty member at Syracuse University. He later became, Greg Newby became a faculty member at the University of Illinois Graduate School of Library and Information Science before my time. Um, and he uh, is now the director of the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. And he still takes care of the systems uh, for Project Gutenberg. So another important detail in this story is none of this was paid for. This was all volunteer labor by people who had other jobs. And all of it was also kind of marginally academic. I mean, Michael was a faculty brat. Both of his parents were faculty at the University of Illinois. Um, and he sort of mooched resources from the university. He mooched resources wherever he could find them. And he got a few other people sufficiently uh, enthusiastic about the project that they were willing uh, to do volunteer labor. Um, so what can we learn uh, about public digital humanities from Project Gutenberg? These are the Gutenberg principles that um, Michael promoted, encourage the creation and distribution of ebooks, help break down the bars of ignorance and illiteracy, give as many ebooks to as many people as possible. Um, so I would say looking at Project Gutenberg as an example of public digital humanities, which I think it is, um, we could say public digital humanities uh, could, can, and probably should always involve the public as creators. They're not, it's not going to be stuff that we make for them. It's going to be stuff that they help to make at a minimum. And in fact, they may make it all by themselves. We may not actually be involved. Um, but an, an important element of the volunteer labor component here and the public creation of content is that it makes clear that the public has something to contribute, uh, which is a point sometimes lost on us. Um, public digital humanities projects depend on public access. I agree with, uh, with Susan entirely on this. They can't really function as they're intended to behind a paywall uh, or under copyright. They really need to take place in the commons in order to, to be effective. Um, public digital humanities projects may not be scholarly digital humanities projects. And they may be driven by one fanatic. Um, Michael was a smart person. He completed his undergraduate degree in two years. Uh, but he was not a student of the humanities. His education was in machine-human interfaces. 
Um, some of the other key players that I mentioned in Project Gutenberg were computing specialists also. They weren't humanists. Um, the people who keyed in text, by and large, were enthusiastic readers, um, but not uh, humanities faculty members. Michael wasn't interested in commentary, footnotes, apparatus of any kind. He wanted to present the material in the most stripped down form, in the most basic formatting, so that it would be accessible intellectually and technically to the largest number of people. Uh, he was really fanatically devoted to that goal at the expense of creature comforts and conventional respectability. Um, so I think some strategies to foster public DH, uh, digital humanities in the future. Uh, find ways to use institutional resources to support the rogue efforts of individuals who may have little or no institutional standing, but who understand the importance of these things. Vision and drive, amateurism and altruism, crowdsourcing and volunteerism, free and public domain information. If people espousing those values show up at your door and ask to borrow some stuff, you should probably lend it to them. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, our next speaker is uh, Laura Mandel, uh, director, uh, director of the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media and Culture, and professor in the Department of English at the Texas A&M University at Texas A&M University. Laura Mandel is the author of Misogynist Economies, The Business of Literature in 18th Century Britain, a long man cultural edition of the Castle of Artanto and Man of Feeling, and numerous articles primarily about 18th century women writers. Her recent articles in New Literary History, What is the Matter? What Literary History Neither he Hears Nor Sees, describes how digital work can be used to conduct research into conceptions informing the writing and printing of 18th century poetry. She's editor of the Poetess Archive, an online scholarly edition and database of women poets from 1750 to 1900, associate director of Nines, or former associate director of Nines, former associate director of Nines, and director of the 18th century, of 18th, of 18th century Connect. Her current research involves developing new methods for visualizing poetry, developing uh, software that will allow all scholars to uh, deep code documents for data mining and improving OCR software for early modern and 18th century texts via high performance uh, and cluster computing. I decided to pick up on a uh, conversation that happened at the Digital Humanities um, Conference last summer in, in Stanford, uh, Digital Humanities 2011. And um, Susan already talked about this for humanities site developed by Alan Liu. Uh, CenterNet held a luncheon, and Alan Liu spoke at the luncheon. And he's a, uh, currently a chair of an English department in California where there's no longer fo uh, phone service for faculty. And um, he was, um, gave an impassioned plea uh, to the digital humanities community to save the humanities um, from being cut from the academy altogether. Um, and we were all very moved. Some of us were crying. Um, but um, I wanted to sort of take a critical look at that sentimentality aside and, um, and actually ask, can or how can the digital humanities save the humanities by helping them become public. A little twist on your topic. Um, the For Humanities site, I think, is actually not such a good, um, I, it has problems with it. For one thing, um, it's set up in a way to have human, humanity scholars foreground projects that may, in fact, rather talk down to people. And, and, and that's what worries me about it a little bit. Um, it's uh, actually, a, a, for Humanities was undertaken by Jeffrey Rockwell, Melissa Taras, and Alan Liu. And I find the sections of it where Melissa Taras, who's a digital humanist in the UK, and who has similarly seen tragic cuts to the humanities, um, she actually um, writes a lot of things that involve uh, the digital humanities, and they don't talk down to people. 
there, um, she's talking to, I think, uh, humanists or to, to anybody who comes to the site as if they were a peer. Uh, I think that's crucial in formulating a public humanities and a public digital humanities. Um, so for instance, another um, site where you see this kind of offer that is just basically, here's what I'm doing. Here's some stuff that's going on. And um, I, I love this, um, this ink site where you can find all these articles. It's like you uh, attended the conference. But um, I think that people just come there and they immediately start getting involved. I don't think we have to dumb anything down uh, for people. One um, thing that happened to me recently is I was Googling um, a digital humanities class. Um, and this actually is um, Googling a definition of the humanities. You can see that the um, fourth definition down, Googling it, um, is a www.units.muohio. Um, and it's a definition of the humanities on a digital humanities course site. Um, by Googling, I'm sort of trying to estimate how often something is used or how often something is um, taken up. I'm trying to estimate uptake. Um, that Google um, result actually is, returns a site that I made a long time ago that's really ugly. <laughs> but um, it's a, a site for digital humanities and um, it, um, it's, it's for about digital humanities classes, or it is digital humanities classes. It presents digital humanities classes. Uh, and it, it has instructions for professors. Uh, and this site has had um, so much uptake. My name isn't on it. Um, but it has had so much uptake that it, it comes up like um, sometimes first and second when you search digital humanities course. Um, and I, I haven't been able to figure out why. For a while, I thought it was like um, Google like targeting my computer. You know, it knew it was me somehow, and it knew that I'd been to that site. So I had I called friends from all over and asked them to Google it, digital humanities course, and it comes up for them too. So um, it's a very weird thing. That um, course really presumes that your the the targeted audience is that you're somebody who wants to teach the digital humanities, and I think that's where we need to aim, and not you know teaching, but um, aiming uh, towards at people who are teachers themselves. Um, so, and this is sort of something I've figured out from my own teaching, is that um, students really only listen to me to the extent that I listen to them. And um, similarly, I don't think people want to be told by humanists what they do. I think they want to do humanities work. Um, this is the Australian Newspaper Digitization Project, and we've all ta been talking about um, participatory projects. The, one of the comments um, that was, they gathered all kinds of uh, data about um, why people spent 64 hours a week, for instance, correcting um, newspapers. And um, it was because, <laughs> well, one of them was elderly and just had a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> uh, but it was also because um, they, felt really flattered by the fact that the library um, told them and in fact provided no editorial oversight whatsoever. Uh, the, a lot of the comments were about that. They were about um, how they felt really good that they could just participate in creating a data set for the library without anybody watching them or saying, you know, you can't do that because you're not good enough. Um, this is the transcribed Bentham, which has already been described. Here's a um, site for transcription that um, we've just launched recently and hope takes off in the same way as the Australian Newspaper Digitization Project and um, Transcribe Bentham. And it's really getting people to read through these 18th century texts and um, correct them. There's no oversight here. All you have to do is sign up, um, register your, a name, an email address, and your own password. And, um, and nothing gets, we actually do have ways of determining bots. And we do have um, editorial oversight um, in terms of users. But once a user has um, started correcting things and is clearly doing a good job, they're free to go. So um, I wanted to say that I, I don't know that the digital humanities um, really can save the, the humanities as they're currently and traditionally constituted. Uh, but rather, I think um, becoming digital is a way for the humanities to save themselves. Thank you.
Uh, our final panelist is uh, Benoit uh, Aubert, uh, uh, qui est professeur de linguistique et informatique à l'École uh, normale supérieure de Lyon. Il a été directeur adjoint du très grand équipement Adonis de 2007 à 2009 et responsable pour le CNRS de la participation française au projet DARIA, uh, projet exploratoire sur les infrastructures numériques et en sciences humaines en Europe. Et il a plus d'une centaine de publications à son effectif, dont cinq ouvrages parus, y compris de l'écrit euh, au numérique, « Constituer, normaliser, exploiter les corpus électroniques »,« Instruments et ressources électroniques pour le français » et « Construire euh, des bases de données pour le français ». Parmi ses intérêts de recherche, on peut compter les réseaux sémantiques euh, et réseaux sociaux, « Analyse de discours et de contenu », Linguistique de corpus, traitement automatique robuste des langues, représentation des connaissances, euh, documents numériques, archivage numérique pérenne. Enfin, je suis un maudit français, donc je vais parler de, de France et de la manière dont les choses s'y passent euh, sur la, la question que, que nous a posée euh, Stéphane. Et euh, la première euh, remarque qui me vient, c'est en ce qui concerne le, ce qui pourrait être la présence des humanités euh, dans le numérique, c'est le fait que à la fois les vies euh, françaises, comme euh, je pense les vies de beaucoup d'autres pays, sont, deviennent de plus en plus numériques, et que euh, c'est quelque chose qui est, sur lequel il y a le, finalement un certain silence. C'est-à-dire que si on regarde le, le débat public français, le débat politique français, il y a des, des choses liées au numérique. On a parlé à un moment donné de fracture numérique, hein, les gens qui n'accèdent pas au numérique. Quand vous êtes euh, au fin fond de certaines campagnes françaises, vous n'avez pas forcément euh, accès à, à Internet. Euh, plus récemment, la question du, du téléchargement. Euh, la question de euh, être moderne maintenant pour un homme politique, c'est tweeter ou des choses comme ça. Des questions comme euh, dans la, dans la récente, euh, dans l'actuelle campagne euh, présidentielle, euh, de savoir si les médias sociaux comme Twitter ne, 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 ne changent pas les règles du jeu, puisque on peut savoir un peu comment se passent les votes avant la fin des votes, des choses comme ça. Donc finalement, le, le numérique est très peu traité. Alors le Là, ce que, la question que, que, que ça me pose, c'est le fait qu'il il me semble qu'avec le numérique, on est en train de, de vivre une, une transformation assez profonde de ce que c'est que travailler de la tête, travailler intellectuellement, c'est-à-dire transformation de, de ce que c'est que lire et de ce que c'est qu'écrire, euh, transformation de la manière même dont on fait du sens et euh, transformation aussi de la manière dont on évalue l'importance euh, des informations euh, et des contenus qui nous sont donnés. Euh, donc là, il y a pour moi un, un enjeu euh, intellectuel, mais aussi un enjeu euh, démocratique. Et puis, euh, d'autre part, le fait que le numérique euh, a un autre... Enfin, donc là, c'est en gros sur le... Euh, on vit une, une transformation du même ordre que le, le passage de, de la lecture euh, à haute voix, la lecture silencieuse vers le XIVe siècle. Euh, là, une autre dimension, c'est le fait que le temps du numérique est quelque chose qui transforme profondément nos vies. On a des vies qui sont euh, fébriles, hachées, euh, enchevêtrées. Enfin, je veux dire, euh, ce n'était pas le cas dans le workshop d'aujourd'hui, mais euh, dans euh, connu des réunions en entreprise où euh, les personnes sont dans la réunion tout en faisant leur mail, tout en répondant à leur SMS. Donc, on des, des sortes de vies un peu particulières. Et la question qui se pose derrière ça, c'est euh, un petit peu pour, pour repasticher... Euh, Simone de Beauvoir, on ne naît pas citoyen numérique et c'est ce que les Grecs, dans la démocratie grecque, appelaient la païdéia, c'est-à-dire il faut apprendre à être citoyen. Est on n'est on est, on est, on est pas naturellement citoyen et donc la question c'est comment est-ce qu'on peut contribuer à apprendre à être citoyen. Euh, Je voudrais insister sur une dimension à partir de ces deux images, c'est le fait que le, le numérique 
produit des effets de fragmentation, donc là, euh, fragmentation euh, du monde à travers euh, des affiches euh, de publicité dans un métro parisien les unes sur les autres, donc il y a une sorte de palimpseste, et puis d'autre part, la, la fragmentation des vies, le fait de dire que nos, nos vies dans le numérique sont des vies en petits morceaux, je veux dire, on mange des morceaux de Twitter, on, on mange des morceaux de blog, on mange euh, des pages euh, séparées, et on a finalement de plus en plus de mal, à un niveau collectif ou à un niveau individuel, à faire un tout de tout ça. Et donc il y a, il y a un effet de fragmentation, et euh, je pense que c'est un, un des grands enjeux euh, d'humanité du, du, numérique publique, au sens où l'entendait euh, Stéphane, que d'être capable de relier des choses. Alors je voudrais euh, citer euh, trois petites choses qui pour moi vont dans le sens, alors ce n'est pas des projets en tant que tels, enfin ce sont des projets mais pas de projets auxquels moi été, dans lesquels j'ai été impliqué mais qui me paraissent être dans ce sens-là. Le premier c'est un projet développé par Bruno Latour à Sciences Po Paris dans le cadre de ce qui est de, est du Media Lab de, de Sciences Po où il s'agit d'apprendre à des étudiants à euh, examiner des controverses, c'est ce que vous avez sur la partie de, de gauche du style, euh, est-ce que les, portables sont dans, les, les téléphones portables sont dangereux pour la santé euh, y a-t-il effectivement euh, fonte des glaces euh, euh, sur, les, sur les calottes polaires et des choses comme ça et euh, l'idée c'est d'apprendre euh, aux étudiants, et donc on, on rejoint la thématique de la paideia à être capable de regarder ce qui se passe sur le, sur le web et de, en quelque sorte, regarder comment se font ces controverses-là, qui est pour, qui est contre, comment les choses s'organisent, comment les choses se répondent. Alors, euh, donc là, ça, ça se passe dans un contexte universitaire, mais avec d'autres institutions qui maintenant euh, travaillent un petit peu dans ce sens-là. Donc là, vous avez un site qui qui présente ces choses-là, et puis vous avez là par exemple la question, une, question une, polémique, une des polémiques qui existent en France sur faut-il disposer et utiliser des statistiques ethniques sur l'origine des gens. Deuxième exemple, il semble qu'il y ait une élection présidentielle en France à la fin de la semaine. Euh, alors si vous, si vous, si vous cherchez sur le, sur le web, euh, si vous cherchez Sarkozy, euh, France Forte, et vous, vous prenez dans Google la, la, la section images, vous aurez plein d'images certaines, donc comme la partie de gauche de l'image, la fiche officielle de, de Nicolas Sarkozy, et puis vous avez également tout un tas d'images et de, de détournements. Euh, alors je ne vous ai pas pris ça, ce que je vous ai pris, c'est l'adresse d'un site, euh, qui est un site qui est lancé par quelqu'un qui au départ travaillait plutôt en histoire de l'art, sur la culture visuelle, et dans lequel il y a tout un travail de, de blogs coopératifs qui, en gros, apprennent, et apprennent les uns les autres, en quelque sorte, à analyser les images, et donc là, en l'occurrence, André Gottner, donc de, du site Culture Visuelle, analysait le rapport entre la, la fiche de départ et puis deux, enfin deux, deux unes de deux journaux différents qui euh, reprenaient ça. Troisième, euh, troisième exemple, euh, où on s'éloigne encore plus de choses universitaires, c'est des exemples de cinéma, enfin de films en l'occurrence, où la dimension numérique est fondamentale pour une nouvelle manière précisément de relier ou de relire euh, les, les faits. Alors, je, je les commande très très rapidement. Un spécialiste, c'est euh, le film qui a été fait par Ronnie Broman et euh, euh, Sivan euh, sur, à partir des archives du procès de Eichmann, dans lequel ils ont numérisé une dizaine d'heures qu'ils ont retravaillées. Et donc, ce qui est extrêmement intéressant, c'est qu'il y a des images inventées qui sont en fait des compositions d'images numériques, il y a du son réinventé, et il y a donc tout un projet euh, euh, artistique et intellectuel à partir de ce, cette recomposition. Dans un autre, euh, dans un autre ordre d'idée, tout à l'heure on, on évoquait le Liban, euh, il y a le film euh, Valls avec Bachir qui travaille aussi sur des nouvelles formes de narration qui incorporent de la bande dessinée, de, du documentaire euh, et... Euh, et d'autres éléments pour raconter l'histoire de quelqu'un qui revient sur ce qui lui était arrivé quand il a été témoin indirect des massacres de Sabra et Chatila. Alors, euh, une, des, une, une des dimensions importantes de tout ça, c'est le fait qu'on est dans, un, dans des travaux euh, coopératifs. Donc là, je vous montre des coopérations humaines qui existent dans le sud de la France et dans le nord de l'Espagne, qui s'appellent les Castellias, c'est-à-dire des, des châteaux humains qui se construisent. Et il me semble qu'on est dans des tours de Babil et non plus dans des tours de Babel, où effectivement il y a du travail coopératif, mais qui reste encore à réguler, c'est-à-dire de savoir quels sont les, les modèles euh, qui vont nous permettre de, de dire qu'est-ce qui est bon et qu'est-ce qui n'est pas bon dans ces, dans ces débats. Et euh, 
Stéphane nous avait demandé d'avoir de, un peu une dimension prospective. Alors, je, je donne des idées un peu comme ça. L'une, c'est euh, une idée qui... Euh, alors, je ne sais pas comment ça se passe pour le cégep euh, au Canada, mais en France, le bac avec le web commence à poser des vrais problèmes. Vous avez les, les élèves qui ont effectivement leur téléphone portable. Ça rend un peu compliqué les examens. Euh, et euh, je sais qu'au Danemark, il y a eu des expériences où, par contre, on dit, ben voilà, vous allez avoir accès à Internet pendant vos examens, et à ce moment-là, évidemment, ça change complètement les règles du jeu. Et donc, il me semble que c'est des choses qui sont à penser, c'est à se dire, voilà, c'est pas, on va, on va dresser des murs de béton, mais on va prendre ça en compte. Euh, deuxième élément, alors on parle beaucoup de la génération Y pour, pour Internet, euh, moi je me demande si on ne pourrait pas par, euh, parier sur les seniors, euh, je, je pense par exemple à l'usage des seniors et des tablettes, voilà, peut-être aussi je pense à mon avenir, donc c'est une chose intéressante. Euh, quatrième, euh, quatrième élément, euh, le, je pense à, à quelque chose qui se fait dans le cadre des, de l'ouverture des données publiques euh, dans la ville de Rennes, c'est-à-dire le fait d'apprendre à des, enfin, des, des hommes de, de la rue, des hommes et des femmes de la rue, à visualiser les données ou à chercher des éléments de visualisation qui permettent de rendre compte de, de choses qui sont compliquées mais de manière visuelle. Et puis un, un, un dernier point. Un avant-dernier point, en l'occurrence, le fait que euh, je pense qu'il y a tout une, un travail à, de fond à faire, au moins en France, je ne sais pas si c'est le cas au Canada, sur la philosophie des sciences et des techniques, enfin des technosciences, pour être capable de précisément d'avoir une vraie culture de ce que ça fait. Et pour terminer par écho à, à tout à l'heure au film de, euh, de, 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 sur Eichmann ou au film de Vansak Bachir, je pense que euh, là où probablement euh, c'est le plus important, enfin vont se passer les choses les plus importantes sur des redéfinitions euh, de la vie publique dans son rapport numérique, c'est précisément dans des nouvelles formes artistiques, c'est-à-dire dans des recherches de formes et dans des recherches de contenu qui sont en train de se chercher. Et je pense qu'il euh, est de notre responsabilité d'être euh, aussi articulé possible avec une dimension esthétique. Merci. Um... Alors, euh, j'avais demandé à euh, Ray Siemens, qui est euh, euh, a Canada Research Chair in Humanities Computing and Distinguished Professor in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria uh, in English with cross-appointment in computer science. Um, Siemens' larger research projects focus on human-computer interaction, interface, and electronic book, and, and the electronic book in the Implementing New Knowledge Environments, Inc. project, Professional Reading Environment, Uh, initiatives associated with tape war, synergies, and the public knowledge project, uh, and works uh, with several team, digital humanities teams and communities. Uh, I'd asked uh, Ray to uh, attempt uh, a type of uh, synthesis of the panel uh, and to uh, facilitate a transition into a discussion. Um, he's agreed to uh, moderate um, uh, questions uh, once we get there. Um, the um, Uh, I've been asked to ask you to come to the mic if you do have a question when the, when the time comes. Great. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, uh, panelists, for some, some really engaging food for thought. Um, trying to summate on the fly, a little bit difficult. Uh, there were some common threads to, to what everyone had to say in, in various ways and in different areas of endeavor, all humanistically focused, uh, if not the humanities themselves, but all generally the humanities. What I'll try to do in my, my very few words now is maybe find a, a path through or a couple of paths through we might consider as we ponder the future of a public uh, digital humanities. And maybe the first observation I'd like to make is, is that if, if there ever was a digital humanities, and I happen to believe there is, but people have different thoughts on this particular matter. Um, it, it was and, and is outward facing. There is no such thing as a di digital humanities that is introspective uh, to the point where there is no outreach component, no dissemination component. There is always an engagement of some kind, even if it is through traditional disseminative type strategies, just electronic. Instead of publishing a journal article, you might publish an electronic journal article. Typically, if you're a digital humanist, you'll be thinking already, as several of our, our group has already said, of open access. That is, publishing it in such a way that people can find it on the internet if they have access to that sort of equipment, uh, not behind a paywall. So a member of the general public could find that sort of thing. And certainly that's been my experience now, going back to, to, to the mid-1990s when I first probably started thinking of myself uh, as a digital humanist. I was teaching a course in a very, very narrow area 
of another very, very narrow area where I expected about five people in my course. I was teaching an introduction to early Tudor non-dramatic verse. No nods of recognition in this room. I, I did have a class of about five people and no textbook because there haven't been any textbooks in that particular area ever. I put together an electronic course pack and I popped it up on, on the web, which was very new at the institution I, I was at. It was a teaching college. And within about two or three days, uh, just by very passively putting this thing online, pointing a few of my students to it, I noticed other people started sending me emails. Hey, you've got this poem by Henry VIII, or Sir Thomas Wyatt, or whatever. Most people like Henry VIII. Um, and taught the course, and it was great. Kept the site online, and it's been there since, well, uh, mid 90s or so. And, you know, every year, a couple emails, someone saying, hey, I happened to come across this as I was typing in, looking for this sort of thing. And then the Tudor's miniseries happened. Some of you may have watched the Tudor's miniseries, but all of the people whose poetry I was teaching uh, seemed to have a presence in the Tudor miniseries. And that one or two emails a year became one or two emails a month, one or two emails a week. And for a short time there, one or two emails a day. So I promptly did what any good academic would do. I documented this in my performance review <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then answered a few emails. Um, that is, I think, the worst type of public-facing digital humanities. I simply put something up online and the public responded to it. It's probably my, my most cited work still. Um, the humanities themselves, though, hasn't always been public facing, al although I believe uh, by its nature the humanities uh, indeed is. Um, the humanities suffers from, from probably many problems, people might say at this point in time, but, but one of the chief problems I think it suffers from at the moment is permeation. We, we have saturated our market in some very, very interesting and unusual ways. Now, if you'll agree with me, this about the humanities. The humanities are, in essence, the study of human experience over time via its artifacts. That's very reductive, I realize, and those of you who are humanists in the room will probably do what humanists do best, which is to problematize. Um, so you can disagree with me, but uh, I hope you'll, at least for argument's sake, agree with me there. Um, digital humanities, then, are the intersection of that particular endeavor and computation, whatever computation happens to be. Computation can manifest uh, as publishing uh, um, facilitators, as we've heard talked about. It can manifest as dissemination, electronic publishing mechanisms of various kinds. It can compare texts. It can be analytical. It can, at the same time as it creates professional networks, it can create public networks and social networks, which is very much on everyone's mind these days. It can disseminate to a populace that may or may not want or care about what it has to offer, and it can involve that same group of people in the creation of our understanding together of what it is to be human and to, to, to relate human experience and understand human experience over time. Now, there are a couple characteristics, I think, of this engagement. The humanities themselves, excuse me just for a sec here, are necessarily remediative. That is, we, we talk about things over and over again, and sometimes we even reproduce those things we've talked about. Uh, a play from the 1700s gets reproduced in the 1800s and the 1900s and gets performed down the street two weeks ago. Um, they're iterative. That is, when we think about things in the humanities, in the humanities way, we tend to build on what's come before. I think John uh, was the first to make the reference that the humanities begin with a look back as well as a consideration of the future. It's part of our method and our process. And indeed, we, we disagree. We react against, uh, as Susan jokingly did in her introduction, saying that she was going to reject the original request and in fact add something considerably of value that, uh, that existed in relation to it. We problematize. We always add value with each different type of iteration, each different type of involvement. Um, and each time we do participate in that process, not only do we add value, but we add value with reference typically to whatever's going on specifically at the time in our own minds and our culture around us. This is a very valuable thing. It's a very human-centered activity, the way in which we behave as those in the humanities. If we do it digitally, more power to us. But these are natural processes we engage in the humanities, even as professionals. We're doing the same types of things that most of those around us generally in a city like Montreal, in a city like Victoria, in a town like Weyburn, are already doing. This is interesting from a number of perspectives, but I would suggest that, that makes the humanities and many of its processes ubiquitous. And by being ubiquitous, 
it means the humanities, in a sense, disappear in a way that computer science doesn't necessarily disappear in a way that, uh, well, I'm on the West Coast, we're studying meteorological and, and, uh, and, and ocean uh, cultures. That doesn't disappear. That's a foregrounded concern. It can't be ubiquitous. But the humanities and the processes of being human and understanding what it is to be human over time can. That can be a danger for us in the humanities because what it means is that we have an inability to be appropriately in our academic environment and our political environment tractable. How are we measured? Well, we're everywhere. Well, how can you measure everywhere? Well, take a look. It's difficult. Computation helps us, I think, a little bit in that regard. When we start doing, going from the humanities now to the digital humanities again, when we start doing what it is we've always done in the humanities, when we start doing what it is most people have always done over time with respect to the nature of their own experience in the context of others, when we bring that to the computer, we suddenly do become tractable. We become measurable. We become productive in really interesting ways, engaging the public in really interesting ways, where those points of engagement can not only be incredibly profitable and, in fact, uh, slightly accentuate a, a natural process anyways, but they do become tractable. They do become measurable. I joked earlier about what any good academic does when they encounter a bit of success. They document it in their performance report. And, and uh, you know, some people do that, and, and I certainly do that. It's part of my job. I have to be accountable in that way, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I'd like to suggest, though, that that type of activity, which is largely for someone who, who does humanistic based work, documenting publications and outreach of various kinds, I, I'd like to suggest that digital humanities allows us to view a different type of publication and outreach, and a very positive one that builds on sentiments expressed variously across all panelists of, uh, uh, of our, our meeting and our time here today. One of the key things it allows us to do is not only to write that article and get it out there, not only to write that book and get it out there in the hope that someone will read it. If you do it electronically, maybe people will come along, and that's wonderful too. But it allows us to do what some argue is, is the, the Adfantis perspective on publication. It allows us to very actively engage and create a public, if you're willing to view publishing as an act of creating, facilitating a public's development. This, I think, is really worth considering especially when we start imagining, well, the crowds that have yet to be sourced, the, the people who have all participated in Project Gutenberg, uh, those who participate in 18th Connect and its typewrite function, those who work with, uh, well, with others in, in this room who, who engage the community generally in social fashions and bring them into the humanities work at the same time as a giving them an opportunity to dictate what that work is and how they will participate. These are things we already do, and I think we do them really well. We can and should do more of them. Um, the context, the phrasing, public digital humanities allows us to, to understand that with an appropriate and, and very important frameworks. Uh, and this is all very good. It's one of the many reasons I'm so happy to have this opportunity to talk to you today much longer than I promised Stefan I would. I'm sorry, Stefan. What I'd like to ask you as you think about how to engage, to talk with the panelists here today about the th projects and concerns they've They've, they've represented us to not only think about what they've done and what they've talked about, what we're doing now, but also imagine with this, within this framework of the digital humanities what we can do next. I think that's probably the most important thing about this. And Stefan and others, I'd like to thank you very much for such a really interesting time together leading into what I hope will be a wonderful discussion.